Thank you, Allie. And thank you, Atlantic Data Team, for putting this together under duress. Donna, you and all of you guys did a fantastic job, and we really, really appreciate it. And we're glad to have an opportunity. I got to be honest with you guys about a couple things. Like you, I'm a little punch drunk from quarantine, so this might be just a little quirky and as, as it has been. Um, I like to run my presentations here as kind of like a podcast format. So yes, there's plenty of content you'll see on screen, and, but there's also some things that are a little bit lighthearted. We're all a little, uh, little uh, zoomed out, as it were. So, you know, this was, I'll, I'll share a couple things, first of all, that are literally completely surreal, some funny, some outrageous. We will get to uh, some meat, um, and I'll, I'm going to direct you. And I know that what happens during these Zooms is that you get pulled in 100 directions, and, of course, your attention span is very short. And unfortunately, today, you can't see my, my, uh, my house. You can't see all the furniture behind me. So, but I will show you. I've had, when I started doing these, um, I, I got asked a lot how I ended up with what looks like a, you know, TV studio in my house. So what you're looking at right now is this. And uh, uh, this is all assembled from parts that I've basically borrowed, begged and stolen from my kids and my neighbors. And we got a green screen. So that's how we achieve this. And I guess uh, my pointing skills on the like a weatherman, you know, to everybody's staying home and hopefully you're staying safe. And thanks for jumping on this morning. Okay. Um, hopefully you're keeping your social distance. Uh, some people got confused that that whether social distance included the Zoom session. So we captured this. I thought that was a funny one and kind of quirky. Um, as you're doing on your back porch, probably we're running uh, Zooms with our friends and everybody's just living in completely surreal times. It's beyond comprehension. Um, obviously, COVID has created a, a new reality that I don't think we've all digested yet. And Many of the people that we work with on a regular basis, um, both inside Checkpoint and outside Checkpoint, have been called, obviously, to task to figure out, number one, how to enable remote workers and how to do it securely. So I'm actually going to share today um, perspectives on three different fronts. Um, and before I get into that and before I start explaining to you which ones I want you to pay closest attention to, let's try to keep this engaging because these Zooms can drone on and on and on. So what I'm going to do immediately, if you don't mind, and I'm going to ask you to participate with me, is I'm going to launch a poll, and I'm going to try to get you guys engaged, and I'm, going to, I'm curious to see, now you should see the poll now on screen, so go ahead and vote when you get a chance, take a read of it. I'm really curious to see how, you know, the different ones we've done. We've done these polls probably, I'm, I'm going to say a dozen times on, a different, you know, the same polls on, on different webinars. By the way, the first poll here, that first answer should be we couldn't, not e couldn't. And I was, uh, if you were on uh, before we started, we were bantering about how low the standard has become for these webinars. And uh, the, if there's a glitch here, a glitch there, if we see a, you know, somebody's dog jump up on the bed, who cares, you know? So anyway, let's see you voting here. Let's see. Okay. A lot of people had a secure solution in place. Right now, about 63% of you had something in place. 34% saying they had a plan and they're executing on it, right? Um, nobody said they couldn't get anything deployed that quickly, which is great. And uh, a very small percent had nothing. So that's good news. So most of you, just to give you a kind of a final, final result on it, 60 plus percent had something in place and are using it. Another 30% had a plan and they're executing on it, which is really good news. So you guys actually, both of those groups are going to get um, very, very, a good amount out of this. And, and I'm glad about that. Um, we have people that are right in the middle of that curve there. Okay. So let me go ahead and stop sharing. And again, I hope you can, I'm, I'm going at a good pace here. I'll keep moving through this here. Let's see here. All right, listen, this is what we're going to do today. And I'm going to try to, and, and I'll ask my, my counterparts and I have my watch here too, but I'll ask my counterparts from, from Atlantic data to watch my clock. And here's what I want to do at about 40 minutes after the hour, which is about double your attention span. You'll be done in about 22 minutes, by the way, studies have shown, maybe you're already done, but I want to, I want to wrap this up by 45. Why? Gives you a chance to get your coffee, get it, have a bathroom break before the next session. So I'm going to ask my Atlantic data team to speed me up or cut me off or, but here's the good news. I'm going to share with you what I call the big three from our war room and the big three are as follows. First of all, perspectives and in decreasing order of uh, importance to you. Where Checkpoint's focus has been in terms of cyber research on the endpoint, how we're going to enable remote users. Most of you are doing some of this already. Can we prevent attacks on the endpoints? What is Checkpoint doing? What 
you know, what is a cybersecurity leader doing like you're doing? You guys are in the same boat we're in. So what have we seen? What are we talking about? So it's checkpoint research in terms of threat. It's checkpoint as a company like you. You guys are in the same boat. And then it's also a set of solutions we can offer that, that allow you to get your users connected, but also get it done securely and, and a couple of next steps at the end. So I hope that meets some useful value. First of all, this is Gil Schwed. He's the chairman and CEO of, actually he's the CEO of Checkpoint. And Gil has addressed us many times, the, our virtual war room many times and been very engaged. I would say in some cases more than once a week, but generally once a week. And Gil has done probably what most CEOs are doing. And he's basically sent a message to us. And I have been guided to send this message to you guys. And the message is very simple. Checkpoint's looking out for its employees, doing anything it can do. And of course we have, you know, we are full speed ahead. And we want to let you guys know whether you're customers of ours or whether you're not customers, that we want to help you guys out and take care of you. So we're not as worried about, um, uh, the sales pitches, you know, there is some of that in there, but as far as product information, but what we want to let you know is whatever it takes for you to get through this, reach out to Atlantic Data Security. We are tied very closely in with these guys. They know who to bring in from my side, whether it's me and my team or others, whatever it takes, we will get it done. We've got eval licenses. We've got expertise. We've got white papers, whatever you need. We got it. Okay. I'm sure that every vendor has been sending, you've seen all the emails from the airline CEOs and the hotel CEOs. I'm delivering this message personally from our CEO. Whatever it takes, we will get it done. All right. In the three domains that are of interest to you today, all right, one of those domains will clearly be what is Checkpoint doing? And for those people that have been with Checkpoint or know Checkpoint a while, this is a gentleman called Joni Fishbein. He's a good friend of mine in Checkpoint. Also happens to be our CISO. So Joni's been called to strike a balance between enabling everybody within Checkpoint to work remotely because our offices and our head, including our headquarters are basically in a, in a work at home mode and also do it securely. So we're talking with Joni almost regularly about this. And I met Joni when I was in Israel at the Innovation Center, right when the outbreak started, right before they shut all travel down in and out of Israel. So I had to sit down with him and I got some insights and now he's an integral part of our, of our team. Not all the news is bad news. For example, here's some good news for you. I was at Sam's Club the other day in my, in my mask, and they do have toilet paper, so that's good news, right? Not all of it's bad news. Um, also, check this out. This is from the Wall Street Journal. A couple of, of engineers from Rice University figured out a way to MacGyver an inexpensive ventilator. Can you believe it? So these guys you know, have done something which could potentially be hugely life-saving. So as we know, um, these kinds of situations spur innovation, spur thinking, and that's happening in the world. But along with that, we have an awful lot of bad things happening because the, the bad actors know full well that this is an opportunity to make, you know, to capitalize. And I'm going to show you some things you probably expect and a couple things that are probably what I would best classify as literally dumbfounding. I think that's a good word, surreal and dumbfounding. So let me show you. First of all, as, as the outbreak, and this is, by the way, a function of Checkpoint's research arm. I don't know if you guys are familiar, but over the last four years, we've dedicated a huge arm of people that do nothing but threat research. Um, the result of which, some of which involves improving Checkpoint products, improve, improving our threat cloud, which I'll talk about later. Some of which uh, involve other vectors, aspects. It's not just a Checkpoint centric world. It's collaborating with researchers and other organizations. Well, of course, we've seen an, a ridiculous spike in coronavirus related cyber attacks. But what, what's that mean? Like, so you're sitting there saying, well, you know, what exactly does that mean? Well, let's start with this one. Um, the black hats have been busy registering coronavirus domain names on the internet. And they've been doing it at an astounding pace. I'll give you a couple of statistics. 16,000 new Corona similar domain names, variations of Corona or COVID were registered in three weeks, in a three week period, 16,000 domains. Now, the first thing that should come to mind when you hear that is that can't be good news. I mean, you know, I'm sure some of them are legit. What, you know, what about the other ones? Well, I'll give you a number. We observed that approximately 19% were going to be used for malicious purposes. So 19% of 16,000, okay? And we are, and you can see, the escalation of these registrations. So you know that phishing attacks, schmishing attacks, you name it, are gonna be pulling people into these, these domain names that will appear. A good example would be the stimulus checks. Of course, 
hopefully you're all getting your stimulus check. Well, you know, whether it be a text message or an email, you can bet you will be seeing illegitimate, you know, texts or emails that invite you to click on, you know, your stimulus link to claim your stimulus. And people unlike yourselves, not everybody's as cyber savvy as you are, are going to be clicking those links. And God only knows, you know, what comes of that. Um, we are seeing an amazing trend on um, uh, uh, um, Google. Google, these, these aspects are, are very easy to, to kind of derive, right? So, of course, everybody's talking about coronavirus on Google. We did a study that tried to overlay what looked like malicious discussions about coronavirus domains, for example. And the traffic is, is spiking obviously spiking, but tracking almost identically to it. Point being, there's as much talk about malicious activity with corona domains and black hat activity as there is legitimate talk about corona. So it's a very serious problem. We're watching this quite, quite closely. Let me share two dumbfounding things with you. This is, this is nothing short of dumbfounding. All right, here's a group called SSA Hacker, and these people are peddling uh, hacking a Facebook account for 300 bucks. Now, I want to point something out to you. That this, is the, this is the dumbfounding part. Let me get my pen up here. Let's see if I can do this here. Yeah, there we go. Look at this. Look at this. They've got a discount code during COVID-19. They've got a discount code. You can hack somebody's Facebook account for $300 minus 15%. That's ridiculous. So you can see they're capitalizing on, on the, you know, the moment like everybody else is. All right? So that's scary. Let's take a look at another one. Here's a you know, too good to be true offer, right? Take a look at this. Here's a MacBook Air for, you know, whatever, to, you know, Corona discount, whatever it is. Hey, we're doing you a favor. Here's the, here's the Corona special offer, right? By the way, this is a malicious website. This is all completely bogus. Um, they're offering to sell you a MacBook Pro because clearly you need a laptop during Corona because everybody's rushing. And this, we're seeing this a lot. People need capital. They need, you know, more gateways. They need laptops. They need all this infrastructure. Hey, let's go uh, find one and buy one. Well, here you go. And this is malicious. So there's a lot of this going on. Um, another thing that's phenomenally interesting is the registration rate of new Zoom related domains. Obviously, the world has been propelled into a new uh, genre of Zoom. Everybody's on Zoom, both personally and professionally. And as a result, the, the black cats have been registering Zoom related domains and leveraging that as an attack vector. So this is very nerve wracking. All right, so let me do this. Let me first, so let me leave you with four principles. I still have your attention for about the next uh, 13 minutes before I become desperate for it. Let me go through four principles first for remote connectivity to allow it. I'm gonna do it on two angles. One, from a more of a policy and a mindset standpoint, and then two, also from a solution standpoint, what Checkpoint can bring to you. Today, you'll be meeting many vendors that are gonna be talking about um, you know, not just Checkpoint, but others that are talking about different aspects and ways to do it. I'll present ours to you as well so you can see it. Number one, it's all about striking. By the way, just to remind you, these are coming out of our own war room. So this is, our, this is Checkpoint from not only a cybersecurity leader viewpoint, but also from a company trying to survive this like you guys are. So we're looking at it from both angles. All right, here we go. Number one, striking a new security pose. You know, which resources does, let's say the principle of least access, which who needs what, but let's give just enough uh, uh, access to get them in. And let's make sure that the infrastructure is scaled to deal with a higher volume, a higher volume of remote access. This is a big challenge for Checkpoint. I'll give you an example. Checkpoint is a company, you know, so you'll, you'll be able to relate because your business has some unique challenge like this. We obviously as sales guys, we're in the field and, you know, we're accustomed to working in the field. But our R&D guys are working with source code here in a, in a cybersecurity company, and they can't be working from home. They've got to do that within the office. So we had to develop an ingenious way not only to allow them to have access to the source code while they're working out of their house by government order, but also we have quintupled overnight, like you, are probably our volume of remote access. So we had to make very, very quick adjustments in terms of scaling. Now, Checkpoint Fortunately for us, our, our ability to scale our remote access solutions is outstanding. Uh, it's been so for years and years. It's nothing new. So we were able to do it, and so will you. But it's definitely a challenge we're all facing, scaling up to the challenge. The second one is a zero trust mindset. Where's the sensitive data? What can we do to make sure that, that um, only the appropriate people have it? And, and most importantly, 
um, do we know who you are and are we using multi-factor authentication? If you're, if you're not, you want to be. You want to be getting into that ASAP because you're, all your remote users are, are really a serious attack factor. Now, in a second, I'm going to talk about solutions not only re related to remote connectivity but also securing endpoints. Every endpoint needs to be looked at, whether it's a laptop or whether it's a mobile device. This is a, a bit of a, I guess some people are pr putting mobile devices on the back burner. Hey, it's fine. You know, I'm not worried about that. I'll talk about some reasons why you need to worry about that. And secondly, where possible, um, dry running, you know, your policy for, for failover, dry testing performance, connectivity, um, make sure that things work, having, a, having a, a sanity to it in a time when nothing is seen at all having a sanity to your test methodology. So those are sort of the four principles. Um, we look at, uh, or should I say, we offer three solutions. I see some chats coming in. So I'm going to, uh, Donna and Christy, I'll, I'll let you guys interrupt me if, if yeah. needed. Just um, someone actually asked if, if this is going to be uh, handed out, these slides. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And, we'll provide it. Yes, yeah, and we're going to put it on our YouTube. So all set yes. with that. Absolutely. Absolutely. No need to write anything down. You can play it back. Plus, I'll be sending, there's another, uh, in a second, I'll, I'll be breaking out to a PDF that we have that I'll also send you, which is even more digestible. So yeah, you can have all of it. Yes. Thank um, you. Let me talk about the checkpoint approach. We're not the only approach. You know, you're going to hear from multiple multiple vendors that are, and these solutions are, are well time tested from us. These are not new solutions or things we dreamt up overnight. Our remote access VPN has been around for, for decades and uh, is a solid and, and tried and true approach to uh, client-based VPN. We also have the mobile access blade, which I'll talk about, and our capsule workspace for mobile devices, which gives a nice secured sandbox. So you have all those available to you. And I, I encourage you to follow up with us in, in Atlantic Data at the end to talk more about it. Um, I'm going to go quickly through this because time goes very quickly. I'm at, I'm at your attention span. I'm aware of it. It's okay. But I'm going to kind of just blow through this kind of quickly. So remote access VPN is cutting that VPN tunnel. And, and uh, you know, you probably have something in place, whether it's a client or whether it's web-based. We offer a couple of options there. We have mobile access blade, which is an ad hoc connection from any device through a portal. All right. Very easy to deploy. In fact, on the curve, it's the quickest deployment we've got. The mobile access blade, it can be spun up very quickly and spun down, and it's fully integrated into our Infinity architecture, which I'll mention in a second. Capsule Workspace is a sandbox that everybody at Checkpoint uses and others. It's a fully uh, a full uh, sandbox solution for your mobile endpoints that really takes the security to the greatest level quite instantly. All right, so that is what um, remote is all about. Let me break out of my PowerPoint for a second. And I do not want to keep the ink annotation, so thank you. I have something I'm going to offer you guys. It's a white paper called Best Practices for Remote Access and Disaster Mitigation Recovery Scenarios. Try saying that 10 times fast in your pajamas. Um, this is a white paper I'm going to provide to you guys. It's a fantastic uh, publication that we put together that gets a little bit more technical than I'm going to be able to do today. It talks about scenarios, five use cases, and the need for um, increasing licensing. And I want to take this moment to reiterate something. Whatever it is you dream up, whatever you want to use from us, whatever you're already using, and if you need more licenses, whatever you need, you let the guys at, at Atlantic Data know, and we will accommodate it. There doesn't need to be POs or any of that now. We'll worry about all that later. Right now, if you need to expand your license counts, let us know. We'll get it done for you, okay? All right. I've been literally talking as fast as I can without even breathing, I think. Um, good time to ask a question, and I'm also going to launch a poll, so if that's okay with you guys. Let's see here. Let me stop sharing just for a second. Any questions that you want to throw in? I know it's a lot for nine o'clock. It really is for um... so someone out here that's wondering um, how you enabled your developers to work on source code from home. <laughs> I can share some of that. I'm going to launch a poll and I'm going to answer the question. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to do both at the same time. Okay. Okay. By the way, totally relevant question, a very, very challenging question because we don't want source code leaving our premises. In fact, they, it will not be leaving our premises. It's a, that is a, a sort of a, uh, a core tenant of a cybersecurity company that's you know, trusting with source code. The way we did it, I would, best, I would best say is done, number one, through secure remote access, ensuring that the endpoints that are accessing our, our, our environment, number one, are fully secured. You'll see how in a second. And number three, that was two, right? Number three is ensuring that they're simply using a kind of remote, like a Citrix or remote access solution that 
does not in, um, involve bringing anything off premise. Okay, so it's like a three tier, three layer solution. All right, and it all starts with securing it. What you've learned just now is how remote access is given through a VPN client. You know, conventional wisdom always was that was security. Of course it isn't. It's a piece of it. I'm gonna show you about mitigating threats uh, with our Sandblast agent, that's how we did it. So a combination of a, a solid security Sandblast agent deployment, as well as a remote access solution that in, in itself is secured by multiple layers of, of checkpoint gateways and itself been vetted by our CISO. Hope that answers it. Okay, here we go. Has your employer mandated everybody to work from home? So we got, uh, interesting. So some people can't do it. We've got 56, let me share the, okay, I'm gonna share the results here. Yes, so you can see them, okay. So a little bit more than half said some people can work from home, some can't. That sounds about right for the real world. Um, in other cases, it's everyone. Everybody's working out of the office, which is fantastic. For those people that are in that, it's a nirvana for quarantine, right? For those people that are caught where some people can't do it for whatever reason, whether it's technical or more, probably more likely not even technical, there might be another reason. Maybe there's aspects that can't be handled. So excellent. Okay, thanks for playing along with my polls. Let me share my desktop again. And let me get into the sort of the, 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 um, the ultimate end, end game. And the reason that I'm here really talking to you today involves uh, the security of endpoints. And let me say that whether or not it's checkpoint, make sure it's something, okay? Your threat vectors on endpoints are, first of all, all devices, on, all these endpoint devices are obviously beyond the perimeter, which is what I do for a living. Anything that's outside the traditional network perimeter. I have a colleague that handles the cloud, you know, the public clouds, et cetera. And for me, it's devices in people's hands, so laptops and mobiles. Trying to keep those, those, those endpoints up to date becomes nearly impossible. And the weakest link of all, as you well know, is you and me and Scott Casper and everyone. It's users. And that is something that for decades we've been trying to overcome without luck. So we try to put um, the controls in place that remove the, dis the discretion from the user to make a mistake that they will later regret. Later regret. 70% of successful breaches start on the endpoint. If you don't believe me, take a look. I won't go through this in, in detail, but I will tell you that three significant breaches have all occurred by compromising a vulnerable endpoint. And you didn't need me to tell you that because you already knew it. Um, this is the, the prime vector of attack. And that's why simply deploying a, um, a, a, a VPN client or some kind of SSL remote VPN on an endpoint is nowhere near good enough, not to mention your mobile devices. So let me talk for a second while I still have about eight minutes about something called Sandblast Agent, which is about threat prevention on endpoints, which is really what it's all about in COVID days. How am I preventing threats while I'm allowing all these people to access uh, work remotely? And secondly, what can I do on my mobile devices? You know, do I have an opportunity to protect corporate data? Maybe I don't want to use a sandbox like Capsule Workspace. Do I have another solution that I can deploy quickly? Um, and, you know, let's face facts. We're not going to be in our offices. We can't be stacking up appliances. So what is it that I can do to get my endpoints secured? Let me introduce you to a couple things you may not know about Checkpoint. First of all, we're a leader in the endpoint space. Sandblast Agent is a total endpoint security solution that prevents against known and unknown cyber attacks. I'm gonna talk about how we do it. We are leveraging the same threat prevention technology, which is important, it's called Threat Cloud, on the endpoint as we are on our gateways. So that means all the investment, all the research we do to make sure the world of Checkpoint gateways and are, are secured all translates to that endpoint. NSS is a third party that has recognized us. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but give me a call and we'll talk more about it. We've got, we've got an overall AA rating for our endpoint solution. This is NSS, obviously, is third party that, you know, it's not a not checkpoint. This is a claim by a third party. Um, fantastic, 100% block rate uh, for evasions, HTTP and email, and uh, low, low TCO. So you, you, we can talk more about that. But more importantly, what are the four layers of endpoint that we need to be looking at and how can they be addressed and I'll, I promise I won't dwell here, but data security, access control and secure communications, what we call threat prevention, which is a very, very broad and, and complex uh, set of engines that cooperate to stop a multitude of vectors. And finally, how do, I, how do I know what happened? 
can I do forensics? Can I do threat hunting? Do I know um, where in the, in, in the attack chain things happen and can I remediate? And that is called endpoint detection and response. And uh, surprisingly, that didn't exist for years. And now that it does exist, no one can imagine living without it. So these are all things that Sandblast Agent can help you with. But more importantly, maybe just for COVID days, these are things you should be looking at and saying to yourself, hey, am I ensuring that I'm not exposing my company's network if I'm not doing any of these things? All right. So threat hunting, let me talk about just for a millisecond. This is really where this is a key part of endpoint, of endpoint um, detection and response and this is where we sift through the mountains of data to look at all kinds of, excuse me, sources of information that maybe are, are not even things you're looking at on a regular basis, looking for indicators of compromise. How do we respond? How do we report? You might say, well, that seems too complicated. I mean, I'm just trying to get through my day in my pajamas and drink a cup of coffee and sit on a hundred Zoom sessions. Where do I even start? So let me tell you what, what Checkpoint has done. And by the way, this has been going on for, I'm going to say now, I think 12 years. I want you to have a good look at this. For 12 years, we have architected something called Threat Cloud. And this is where Sandblast Agent leverages security updates in real time. I'm not going to read the numbers to you, but have a look at this. These, is, these are the things that we are aggregating in Threat Cloud. We have 150,000 security gateways worldwide that are aggregating all of these, uh, these, these aspects, okay? And your endpoint security can realize the benefit of that literally in a millisecond. And that's where you want to be. You want to be making sure that you're tying your endpoints in to some kind of threat prevention solution that is on top of the game. So what you see in Threat Cloud is not only a collection of stuff that we've seen across all those gateways, but also our own research arm, um, our customers, uh, things we're seeing uh, among many different feeds. We do all the work. You don't have to do any of that. All you've got to do is make sure you're tapping into it. So that's called Threat Cloud. I've got 931, so I've got a short, uh, short time to kind of go through this. Uh, Sandblast Mobile. Um, this is all about mobile security, right? So basically the long and short here is that people are ignoring mobile devices. Why? Because some of the, the exposures that although have they've been, you know, quite visible, haven't been, even they started on the mobile, maybe the mobile was the beginning point. Of course, they've expanded from there. But let me tell you the thing about mobile security that makes it remarkable, especially with our Sandblast Mobile. You can have your endpoints secured within about 10 seconds the spin up of a mobile security portal and the inclusion of these devices is as simple as installing an app. Um, and we have a fantastic layer of protection that involves stopping malicious app side loading. If you're familiar with it, I could spend another hour and I, I'm happy to do it. Um, phishing across apps, man in the middle attacks at the network layer, blocking um, uh, infected devices from getting to corporate applications. Uh, detecting exploits in the OS, all these things put together. By the way, these can be bring your own devices. You're not issuing company phones for this. You can have this running, and we all do here at Checkpoint, of course, and we have many customers that are doing it. The ability to leverage what Threat Cloud is doing to have that security on your mobile device quite painlessly. So I encourage you to make sure that you're looking at your mobile devices and you're, you're ensuring some kind of security there, okay? I'm going to kind of blow through this because we're kind of short on time. What about MDMs? We have an MDM, you know, we, we manage some of our mobile devices through, a, through an MDM or a UEM, and that's good enough, right? So as it turns out, it's the biggest myth in mobile security. You know, neither your MDM nor your UEM have anything to do with really actually preventing threats to your endpoints. It might be a great way to manage them. So we integrate with all of them. Uh, and, you know, there's even one more that's not on here. The, uh, so anyway, we could talk more about it. But what you do is you leverage your existing MDM to roll out the Sandblast mobile and you realize that security within a couple of minutes on your endpoints. So don't get confused. MDMs are not and UEMs are not security. Uh, that's a common misconception. Anyway, that's kind of an overview of, um, of you know, the solutions. So uh, in a quick review, the first step is obviously enabling access remotely. That's fantastic. The second one is ensuring that what's happening today, which is completely surreal, is not compromising your endpoints. And, uh, and you're doing that by leveraging Threat Cloud through Sandblast Agent or Sandblast Mobile. Clearly, it's part of a bigger picture uh, here at Checkpoint, part of our Infinity architecture, which I'd love to expand on in a, another call. And again, reach out to the Atlantic Data Guys and we can tell you more about that. All of this complements what you know about us, which is all about you know, gateways. Uh, we go way beyond that. Um, and with that, I'll leave this up here. And what I'd like to do, actually, I have another poll to kind of leave you on a lighter note. 
before I do that, let me open this up to any questions people have. Anybody have any questions? I don't see any. That's because I literally didn't take a breath for the 34 minutes uh, that we went here. People are just glad that, you know, I think the attendance on the Zooms, I want to tell you, I'll share one more thing with you. Let's go to a poll too. Let's wrap with a poll here. I'll tell you that the, uh, that the uh, one thing we learned about, even when we have an hour set aside for a Zoom, that again, the attention spans, if in a perfect world, is about 22 minutes, right? Um, and in an imperfect world, is a lot less than that. We also learned that, uh, that the attendance levels to these Zooms have been the highest uh, we've ever seen because I think people in, in, in some strange way are obviously want to be informed. So we're glad to be doing that, but also just so happy to be in contact with other people, even virtually. So it's actually hilarious. Okay, guys, I want to thank you. And I want to thank Atlantic data. I'm going to run one more poll that we can have a little fun with. I want to thank you guys for joining me and sitting through my presentation. I actually have the best time slot of the day because it, as the attention span begins to wane and zoom fatigue sets in, I want to let you know that your call to action, of course, is to we'll get you all the information we've talked about. Reach out to the Atlantic Data Security guys. They are tied in very tight with us. Uh, we, we are responding, I think, as quickly as we can. Um, reach out to those guys. We can have a sit down separately. We can hear more about you know, what you're doing, what your challenges are. Obviously, these large sessions, it's not possible to hear what your unique requirements are. Let's sit down and talk about it. Again, things like purchase orders and pricing and budgets are less important to us. What we're here at Checkpoint, what, what's important to us is making sure you guys are able to keep your, your workforces remotely uh, um, uh, working and in a secured way so we can help you spin all that up, okay? So there's my, my uh, hug, goodbye, and uh, thanks for joining my session, and I'm gonna give you a bio break in a, in a couple of minutes here. Before I do that, let's have one little fun poll. And I, I realize that, Okay. I realized I didn't allow my panelists to vote. So I guess maybe the Atlantic data people can't. Yeah. I was going to say, I'm kind of annoyed. I can't. Oh, hold vote. on a minute. Let me, let me, let me do it again. I'll do it again. Hey, hold on. Allow panelists to vote. Okay. okay good. Good. Now you can, you know, now you I can hope I'm in. voting on your outfit. Cause I am ready. <laughs> so for those people, okay. I can, I can say this. All right. It's okay. We're just, we're just, it can be light. It doesn't have to be formal. I'm going to go ahead and say this. This, this is one of my, you know, obviously one of my work shirts. By the way, the poll is live. So if you have a chance, do you see the poll? I'm, I'm wondering. No, I don't see it. Okay. Hold on. Something happened here. Let's relaunch it. Can you see it now? It's a fun one. I don't want you to miss it. Okay. Polling, polling is open. Can you see it? No. Okay. Let me end it and start it. You know, again, the standard is very low for, uh, here we go. Let's try it again. How no. about now? Yep. Is that good? Yes. Okay. While you're voting, while you're voting and being entertained, I'll tell you that this is, you know, my Zoom outfit and we're doing, I might, maybe I'm doing like five Zooms a day. You're probably doing the same thing. You're sitting on them, you're presenting on them, whatever it is. And so it's like, wear the shirt. I have like three shirts in the rotation. This is way too much information. So you, you know, you wash them, you iron them. Usually like Scott Casper, I send them out professionally and they get done. But these days my wife and I have had to adapt and it's a first world problem that, you know, wash your own shirt, iron it, whatever. So we made it work. I wish I could have added something in my other, like, you know, I don't what know. What would you some, like to add? I, I don't know. <laughs> I had a few things to add, but mine wasn't there. Notice how my video is not on, but I, I don't do care notice. if you're wearing sweatpants, Brian, you look great. Okay. Well, I, I'm not going to go below the waist, obviously, because that's <laughs> off limits for the Zoom okay. broadcast. So, okay. but, uh, yeah, it's just so surreal, guys. And, uh, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap. And I think if I still have your attention after 38 minutes, I think I did a pretty good job. But let's see. Now, what happened here? Um, uh, did, did we lose it? Let's see. Oh, I don't know what happened. The poll ended. Anyway. Oh, I'm sorry. You know what? Uh, I re you I ended it. You ruined it. You ruined the whole thing. No, I'm just I can't kidding. go so on. It's it. I can't go on with life. I have to, it's all over for me. Um, again, thanks a lot. And at this point, I'm going to let you have a bio break five minutes early. You're welcome. And thanks I wish you energy. all, we appreciate I, I, it. I, please stay safe. Please stay quarantined. And I'll, I'm going to watch and, and, and uh, I will see you guys next time. All right. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Brian. Thank you. Yeah, that was great, Brian.